Yo, what is up guys, Grim here, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you guys how to get rich off of Exarch and Eater of World influence farming in Alk and Go maps. But first, if you enjoy the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this video specifically, give it a thumbs up. Okay, without further ado, let's get into it. So first up, of course, I said Alk and Go. Yep, absolutely, I stand by it. You're going to be able to accumulate a massive amount of endgame crafting materials for the Exarch and Eater of Worlds, a ton of really great Scarab drops, as well as a ton of currency, as well as maybe even a few good uniques, using the strategy I'm about to talk about here. So everything on that list, except the uniques, is absolutely immune to the economy for the most part. There's always going to be big demand for scarabs and of course currency is currency uh, and the end game crafting materials are going to be mega demanded as it is incredibly powerful system. So overall this is going to be a tried and true backbone strategy everyone should have at their disposal and you're about to get the inside scoop on how to maximize your profit using that strat. Okay let's get into the ground level. First up you're going to need access to either the Exarch or Eater of Worlds and you're gonna need unrestricted access. So in order to take this um, strategy on board and use it, you're first going to have to slay either the Exarch or the Eater of Worlds on their quest level. After doing so, you're going to gain access to unrestricted abilities of using their influence. So previously you had to kind of go with the flow and make sure you're doing the right tier map to kind of you know, move through the quest line. After you defeat them once, any T14 plus map can be influenced with their influence unrestricted. So what does that mean? Well, it means you're able to put in all of the extra monsters of the influences unlimited on any amount of maps for free. Anyone familiar with Elder Scarabs in the past knows how powerful this is. And baseline, everyone is receiving way, way more pack size, way more juice, and it's completely free. Definitely pretty powerful. Okay, so that's the first thing you guys need to know. Everything is baseline and you can use it on every map and you absolutely should be if, you're, uh, if your character can handle it. And that'll be a topic for later on in the video. Okay, so first question is gonna be, of course you have two options, the blue or the red. Which one should you farm? Well, first of all, uh, there are a few things to consider. Number one is which one is easier for your character. If you're not able to do the content, you know, nothing in this video matters. So pick the one which your character can actually do. Uh, second of all, you need to make sure that you enjoy doing it. So, you know, if you hate Eater of Worlds, you hate the look of it, all sorts of stuff like that, do the other one, it's fine. Uh, but when we go into the real mid-max side of things, there is going to be a correct one for everyone's play style. So let's go over the differences first. First and foremost. So the first one is going to be their crafting currency. So the Eater of Worlds obviously drops the Ica currency and the Exarch drops the Embers. These will have a different trade league value and it is going to be incredibly different in my opinion due to some of the things we'll talk about in this video. So make sure you check the prices and overall uh, it's going to be pretty interesting to see how that plays out. But that's difference number one. Difference number two is going to be the boss keys. So obviously the different bosses have different loot tables as well as the fact that they drop their different currencies, the demand for these keys is going to be different. So I'm not sure which one's going to be more in demand at this point, uh, but it's fair to say one key may be twice as more expensive than the other one. And when you're completing Exarch and Eater of Worlds maps, uh, that is definitely something to consider as it's going to be a consistent amount of currency that you're bringing in. Every 14 maps, you're going to get a key. Uh, so the first 14 will be to the uh, the Black Star or the Infinite Hunger, and the next 14 will be to the Exarch or Eater of Worlds. So right now, Eater of Worlds keys are about 40 Chaos. Uh, so, you know, that's about, you know, a little over a Chaos per map that you're getting for free, uh, which you definitely need to factor in. I believe the Infinite Hunger is 7c for a key right now. So those are definitely things to note and things that you're gonna to wanna to look at when selecting your chosen uh, influence type. Okay, moving on. The last difference which I wanna talk about uh, is going to be the passive tree. Now we're gonna go into this in a lot more detail because it's incredibly impactful later on, but there's two different notables which are different on both of the sides of the tree. So the first one is going to be uh, this one over here. Uh, this one is kind of relates to the other one on the side here. So for Exarch, we have Light of Dawn. The counterpart is um, Shadow of Hunger. They have completely different effects. Uh, and then for the bossing side of things, we have Regurgitated Relics for Eater Worlds. And then we have Liberated Knowledge for Exarch. And they have reasonably similar effects, but they are different in how they will work out. So those are the only differences. Make sure that you study up on them and make the decision which is best for you. Okay, now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's talk the juice. So of course, you're in your maps and you're getting a ton of extra free monsters. Great, awesome, that's, that's fantastic. 
Like everyone likes extra monsters, but that's just the beginning. Where the real money is made and where you're gonna get all of the extra juice, which I talked about earlier, is using Eldritch Altars. So Eldritch Altars are essentially these altars which spawn in your maps after killing a particularly large or um, you know enchanted pack of eldritch monsters so generally you get about you know one to two maybe three four if you're lucky of these eldritch altars in a map and they are incredibly powerful but they come with very very massive downsides in some cases so you can see here 50 percent cold and lightning resist to the boss that's going to make some builds just have no damage against the boss and that could be a problem now i personally for my play style haven't had any issue with any of these modifiers but i know there are a few modifiers which really ruin builds for example Example, there is a modifier for uh, projectiles which makes projectiles fire randomly in any direction around you that is very difficult to use as an EA character uh, so overall you're gonna have to look out for some of those mods uh, but I just kind of click through them and you know if I die an extra time that's fine the rewards are well worth the risk but it is something to keep in mind if there's one that really does hurt your build okay so when you're looking at these altars obviously you're going to get a ton of bonuses so you can see here two percent chance to drop an additional unique item and obviously the boss one could have drops three additional unique items but it's important to note that there is actually three categories of options that you have available to you on these eldritch altars so you have the crown option here which is basically going to add the drops on this modifier specifically here only to the boss so you can see on the crown here we have drops three additional unique items that means it's adding that to the boss only exclusively it's not going to drop three uniques off anything else uh, when you see this kind of minion horde one here that means that it's applying this modifier to all eldritch minions in the map so basically any eldritch monster which spawns is going to have a two percent chance to drop an additional unique item if there's 200 mobs in the map uh you know that's going to give you four unique items i think that's right yeah four unique items on average so that's incredibly um, important to realize Okay, um, so let's go on to the third type though here, um, which is player affected. So essentially, this is going to be a buff that is placed on your player. Um, so when you see something like unique items dropped by slain enemies have 14% chance to be duplicated, well, that actually means it's going to duplicate everything in the map. That's not limited to anything like to do with Eldritch or the boss or anything. So, you know, if you, um, if you kind of like uh, kill a monster, like a beyond monster, and it drops a unique, it could be duplicated, which does open up quite a lot of interesting scenarios for players and strategies. And it's worth noting that this specific modifier, the player's gain, does in fact work with the new Arc Nemesis League. So for example, in this scenario, if you wanted to do some sort of Shikari touched strategy, uh, you would be looking for a map in which you received one or two of these player gains, uh, unique enemies, uh, unique items are duplicated before you did your big Shikari combo. Keep in mind though, that all of these modifiers also apply to everything in the map so if you're doing a ton of player gains and then it says 30 percent chance for enemies to drop shock ground and stuff like that that's all monsters in the map and this is particularly important to note when you're doing some very hard lead mechanics like expedition or metamorph it can get very difficult very quickly and you need to make sure you're aware of the difficulty spikes when you select this specific modifier type Okay, so those are the three different types. Now there's a few different things that you can acquire from these modifiers, and I'm gonna go over a few of them. I don't believe there's a comprehensive list yet, uh, but overall there's a bit of a theme in what rewards can drop and which things you can modify. So overall, there's gonna be pretty much uh, three different things that we're gonna be able to get. Um, so four in total. So there's unique items which you can modify. So you can get percent chance to drop uniques on minions. Uh, you can get percent chance, to, sorry, you can get 100% chance to drop them off the boss. So you can see here, you can get three unique items. Uh, and then you can also get the chance to duplicate those unique items as well with the player based ones. Uh, the next one you can do is scarabs. Uh, so you obviously can get the chance, the flat chance, and then of course the duplicate. Uh, there is maps as well, but there's only the chance to duplicate those as an option. And then lastly here i believe that there is also basic currency as well as eldritch currency now eldritch currency is a bit of an interesting one because this is one which has a bit of a difference so if you have a 0.9 percent chance to drop a eldritch currency on the minion ones well you're going to drop stuff like you know ickers and embers all over the place it's going to be fantastic after running about 100 or 200 of these altar based maps i have never seen any of the minions ever drop anything like an eldritch exalted annulment or chaos orb it's not possible from what i can see however that is completely different on the boss counterparts bosses 
is when you get the modifier drops x eldritch currency items almost always drop an eldritch exalt uh, you know chaos or even multiple of them and very rarely drop any of the eldritch ikis or embers it's more most likely to give you the actual reroll currencies uh which right now are worth about you know anywhere between you know three up to ten c uh but after we kind of get through a lot of the videos on this channel i imagine these are going to be incredibly expensive as they are the backbone of the new crafting system and they're incredibly powerful and they are very undervalued right now Okay, so we've established all of the modifiers and we've also established the different modifier families that you can get. So overall, the most powerful ones, in my opinion, are going to be the minion based one, the eldritch minion based ones, because they're a flat percent chance to drop the desired item. There's no use having chance to duplicate scarabs unless you have a source of scarabs. So the eldritch minion ones are always going to be probably worth picking up. Uh, even the percent chance to get unique ones are essentially going to give you four or five uniques per map, which you wouldn't get otherwise. Those could be very very good could be a headhunter pretty impressive but as you kind of get more and more alters the value of the player based ones to duplicate goes up and of course if you're pursuing a specific strategy which could take advantage of it for example doing the triant combo with all those scarabs you actually could capitalize on these modifiers as the best ones now when it comes to bosses uh, in my opinion the only modifier which really stands head and shoulders among the rest is going to be the one that drops the eldritch currencies those are the only boss modifiers i tend to take uh, unless there's a really bad option as the other one i always take the um the kind of minion and player based ones uh you know if there's scarabs you know i might consider taking three scarabs from a boss uh, but overall they're a little bit underwhelming compared to what you could get off of the minions in my opinion and the reason for this is because minions scale with map pack size so if you get into your map and you have a ton of pack size well the eldritch monsters are just going to be much more plentiful and when we get to the atlas passives you'll notice that you have the ability to enhance that even further so the minion ones generally are going to have the edge however there is a very interesting interaction that you can force with eldritch alters so this one is going to probably play a big part on how you play the league and this end game content. Okay, in certain maps, you can actually access the boss of the map very, very easily. So you can see here, the entrance of City Square is up here and the boss of the map is right here. You could literally just walk straight in and kill the boss. And you know, this is what I tried. And after trying this, and I found that altars no longer spawn the boss based modifiers anymore after you first slay the boss. Makes perfect sense, right? Well, this creates a scenario in which you can manipulate the mod pool. As we mentioned, we found the minion and player based one quite a little bit more powerful with the exception of the Eldritch Currency one. Well, when there's modifiers like Eldritch Minions have 3% chance to drop extra scarabs, and then an additional modifier is like 15% chance to duplicate those scarabs, would you rather have all those modifiers stacked up, giving you an absolutely juiced out map, or would you rather have it diluted with additional boss modifiers, which might not be what you were looking for? Well, I think that I'd rather go with the former if I'm farming that kind of a strategy and not interested in the Eldritch Currencies. And essentially, this creates a scenario in which you can block out one third of the mods and in many cases the most worse one third of the mods which is incredibly powerful and is going to yield even better results uh, in your alcango maps it's not uncommon in a good map to walk out with 20 to 30 scarabs uh, of you know varying different rarity of gilded rusted and uh, polished which is probably going to net you a 60 or 70 chaos payday uh, at the end of the day depending on what you pick up so it's definitely not too shabby and you probably want to look into maybe even farming city squares if you can come to the boss kill them first and then you can get the rest of the altars and they're all going to be minion and uh, player base which is incredibly powerful and it's going to increase your chances of getting a ton of scarabs quite a lot which is going to be pretty damn good okay so that's altars and all of the different modifiers they have and a way to manipulate them as well as which one are my personal favorites definitely make sure you're doing the altars but definitely watch out for the difficulty there's one awesome kicker and a bit of extra juice that they threw in with altars though and that is going to be the fact that when you actually pop them they spawn about as much as a strong box of uh, monsters in the map which actually means it creates an interesting strategic option for us. Now, if you're purely clear speed focused uh, and you just want to get through as many maps as possible, which is probably the most profitable, uh, you could just, you know, click every altar and not worry about it. But it does introduce a sort of gameplay in which if you get a particularly bad altar or an altar that's not too impressive, you could potentially store those monsters in there uh, for when you get better modifiers and then come back to it later on, 
pop it and then get a few extra ones out of your super juiced map and this is particularly powerful if for example the first altar is like uniques and gems uh that's another one actually i forgot to talk about gems that is also in the pool uh uniques and gems uh well you could save that one not pop it and then get six percent chance to get scarabs to drop from eldritch monsters for example and then come back and get an extra four or five scarabs from that one altar so that is definitely an option that you want to look into and it can be quite an uh, an appealing one Okay, pretty damn good in my opinion. Pretty cool. Okay, so let's move on now to the actual juice. So we've of course know all of this massive amount of money that we can make and we know how to get it now. The altars, uh, when you're doing the maps, you want to obviously be careful with them. Let's talk about maximizing our profits now with these Eldritch Horrors and uh, seeing what we can kind of do to take us to the next level outside of manipulating the, the mod pool with the boss stuff. Okay, so when we open up the passive tree, we were talking about some differences between the Exarch and the, um, and the Eater of Worlds. Well, let's talk Atlas passives. So first up on the agenda, you have the Eater of Worlds pack size as well as Exarch pack size. So as I mentioned, it's very, very, very powerful to have additional influence monsters in your map and it's going to give you more chances at getting those scarabs or you know like all of the ickies or anything like that it's great uh, so getting pack size is essentially just a massive more multiplier to the chances of you getting those items so this if you're farming the end game influence types and you're in plenty and you're enjoying them i would definitely uh, encourage you to invest in one of these pack size wheels completely i find them very powerful and i think i can definitely wholeheartedly recommend them uh, in addition to that, you of course have the Notable. The Notable, un funnily enough, it's actually the weakest node on this uh, cluster. However, it is there and you should probably pick it up uh, instead of taking a Travel Node as it is going to give you 10% uh, more Ickers and Embits, which is, you know, pretty good. Uh, not too bad. Not totally sure what a touching tentacle mass is, but you know, anyway, that's not, that's beside the point. Okay, so the next difference that we need to talk about here is up with the Shadow of Hunger, uh, as well as Recogitated Relics on the Eater of Worlds side. So we're going to start off with the Exarch so I can show you how they are different and what scenario you'd probably want to use each of them and which kind of playstyle would suit each of them. Okay, so first up, let's talk about the Light of Dawn. So the Light of Dawn gives you 20% chance to spawn a Searing Exarch altar when the influence of the Searing Exarch first appears in the area. So the influence generally appears at the very start of the map there'll be a big pulse and then a bunch of monsters will start spawning and for the rest of the map you'll get those big packs that sort of deep strike in it's pretty great okay so this one is saying that we get a 20 percent chance to spawn an altar right out of the gate so one of the most frustrating things with the influence farming is you kill a pack right at the end of the map and you get an altar which says like three percent chance for monsters to drop scarabs and you're like oh so much money I could have had. Well, the Light of Dawn is going to give you an altar right at the start of the map. And the most powerful maps you'll run are where you get the best modifier right at the beginning, and it's an insane one. So the Light of Dawn could, in theory, give you a 3% chance to get scarabs from monsters at the very beginning of the map, and then you proceed to sweep the map and get a ridiculous amount of currency, and it's really great. So it's one in five maps, though. So overall, it's not going to be too common, but it will happen. Uh, and then in addition to that, it also has Eldritch Embers have 10% chance to be duplicated for each Shivering Exarch Altar used in areas. So I said there's about four to five of them. So it could get up to being, you know, 40% more, which is pretty good. But this does stack additively uh, with the, the chance down here. So it is important to note uh, that it's not a true more multiplier, but overall it's gonna give you some extra juice and you will definitely notice those duplicated Eldritch Embers, which is pretty great uh, and you know overall pretty good. Now the downside here is though, this is definitely gonna make it incredibly hard. Players take 10% increased damage for each Steering Exarch Altar used in the area. So by the end of the map, uh, especially if you leave the, the boss until last, uh, you're gonna be taking you know anywhere between 40 to 50% more damage. Uh, which is no no small amount, especially on top of all the other altar mods that you're messing around with, it could make the boss an absolute nightmare. So overall, the Light of Dawn, pretty good node, some reasonable potential, uh, but nothing too insane. Okay, so Liberated Knowledge is essentially going to give you a flat chance to get uh, Exceptional and Grand Eldritch Embers, uh, both of which I think are going to be pretty expensive. And then it also has, obviously, the, the generic chance to increase the new Chase Jewel. Okay, let's compare that to the Eater of Worlds now. So the Shadow of Hunger. So remember the counterpart is to get a 20% chance of an altar at the very start of the map. As well as some, you know, duplication for the, the Ickers and Embers of, of the, uh, the Exarch type. Okay, so the Shadow of Hunger simply says 50% increased chance to find Eater of Worlds altars and areas. That is crazy. So if we take our mark of about four to five, now it's six to seven, maybe even eight. You get absolutely yoked out of your mind on altars on Eater of Worlds. Now the altars are really where you get a lot of your value and a lot of your money from. So having more of these is just a free 
win. You're gonna get more chances of the boss one, which gives you exalted orbs or annulment orbs. You're gonna get more chances at getting scarabs or chance to duplicate those scarabs or even scarabs twice. One of my maps, I had 6% chance for monster drop scarabs. It was crazy. So when you compare the two, uh, it's pretty apparent, in my opinion at least, that Eater of Wells is the superior choice if you're looking to farm altar-based mods. Yeah, you could have a really great scenario in which you get that one in five map chance to be an insane modifier on the uh, the Exarch, but just having 50% of the altars being increased uh you have to more altars it just is it's too hard to compete with therefore if you're trying to do this alk and go strategy and you're trying to farm scarabs you're trying to farm the exalts the ikes or anything like that eater of worlds is definitely the play there is no doubt about it if you're trying to farm those currencies this is the guy to farm however this is going to have a massive impact on the economy overall because if everyone farming scarabs in alk and go maps um is doing Eater of Worlds, and they're trying to farm the Eldritch Exalts and the Annals of the bosses, which is just getting more altars, for example. If they're all doing Eater of Worlds, well, the Eater of Worlds, Ickers, and, you know, overall, are going to be far, far cheaper because everyone's going to have them. There's going to be an overabundance of them in the economy. And you know what's not going to be as much in the economy? The Embers, which is going to automatically correct and give the Ember players a far higher profit margin on those side of things. So, you know, you can see how this is going to start to balance out, uh, but it is pretty hard to beat the amount of Scarabs that you get with Eater of Worlds and also the opportunity to get those really tasty endgame crafting items. So overall, Eater of Worlds, in my opinion, is the superior of the two. However, with all those altars, it is going to get quite scary and you do need a character fully equipped in order to deal with it. Okay, now, interestingly enough, uh, it's actually far harder to get the actual um, end game T4 currency to craft with on Eater of Worlds. And the reason for that is because there's no flat chance increase uh, for the exceptional and grand um, currencies. Now, I can confirm after doing hundreds of Eater of Worlds maps, uh, you do not drop the T4 Ica from maps. Uh, I don't think it's possible. I've done a, like a lot of maps. I've never dropped one. So if this is some sort of thing that is required in crafting, uh, it's going to be incredibly uh, expensive in my opinion, and there's no flat modifier to the chance of the boss getting it. So overall, it's probably far more lucrative to farm the actual Exarch himself in terms of acquiring T4 currencies, and the actual farming of Eater of Worlds of the actual boss himself is lower. So it's kind of got this interesting dynamic uh, where the bossing is higher in terms of the potential of Exarch and the actual mapping potential of Eater of Worlds is far higher. So let's tie it all up. And I want to give you guys the kind of massive notes here to kind of really break it down and make you understand. So when you're farming the strategy, what are the things that you require? Well, you're going to require some T14 plus maps and a character capable of dealing with the ultimates, mods. And that's all you need. There is no other requisites. You can farm any map. It's great. You may want one where you can get to the boss early if you're interested in that strategy, but that's it. Now, what are the things that you're going to get? The things that you should be selling, the things that you can actually get rid of? Well, let me take you to your hideout and I'll give you guys an idea of what they're currently worth and what you guys should be selling. So first up is going to be quality gems or any gems that you drop as a result of your pairing through the altars and you know those can be worth you know five to ten C. Uh, you can convert them to GCPs if you want that might be worth your time. I'm personally not too interested in gems but that is a potential. The other one here is uniques. You can drop some good uniques. I dropped for example an Aura Rages or Aura you know the Aurora Aegis. I dropped that for two exalts and I also dropped multiple flesh craft which is the skilly mage chess piece you're gonna get good uniques you can sell those those are pretty good but the real money in this strategy actually comes from the itches and embers let me take you in on what i've been doing with them so I farmed up a good 100 of each of the lesser and greater, uh, and I've probably farmed, you know, 50 to 70 of the grands. So overall, these give you a ton of currency and the demand is almost insatiable. They fly off the shelf in minutes. That may change in the future, but I think it's only going to get better because I, I think a lot of people are gonna start crafting their end game gear and it's gonna take quite a lot of these to get the modifier you want. Okay, so I generally price these in bulk. I only sell 10 at a time to save time. So as you get 10, I would recommend pricing them at around 15 to 20 kills for the lessers. Uh, keep in mind, if you're doing Exarch, yours will be worth more, most likely. Uh, and then the um, actual greater Eldritch Ickers, I sell them for a bit more. And then the grand ones, they sell for quite a lot more.
So overall, make sure you sell them in groups of 10 to save you some time. Make sure you just, you know, make sure you keep an eye on the price. Don't put it too low, but also put it, you know, at a place where it will actually sell. These are going to be a massive moneymaker for you. Uh, and make sure you pay attention to which one is going to be more favorable for the uh, actual farming based on these Icar and Ember prices. Because this is, at the core, one of the big sellables that you're going to have. So make sure you base your decision off of that. Maybe the Exarch actually comes into power in this kind of you know, area once the prices settle a little bit. Okay, the next thing you're gonna get an absolute ton of is of course scarabs. Uh, now I've been trying to madly sell these things as fast as possible, but you can see they just stack up. I have too many of them. Now you're gonna get a ton of these and I would recommend selling these in bulk as well to get better prices, uh, but you can do a little bit of a trick on the bad ones, which no one wants. For example, no one's gonna want elder scarabs because actually elder scarabs disable the new influence types. So no one's ever gonna want these. You can use your horizon orb uh, to actually re-roll these. So if you get 10 horizon orbs, for example, you can quickly vendor them using the scarab recipe and get an additional random amount of scarabs, which might sell a little bit better. So blight scarabs, those definitely sell uh, for about 3C and then 4C or 5C in bulk. So those are your sellables. You will obviously get a few other things, but those are the main things you want to sell. There is potentially a market uh, for Eldritch bases. However, we're not sure about that yet. Uh, that's going to be the video, guys. Please let me know what you thought of this kind of a video. I put a lot of effort in discovering all this stuff. Hopefully you guys enjoy the money that comes from this and i wish you all luck in the new league stay tuned for more content stay safe out there cheers